Hello, it's Cynthia, and welcome to Classrooms for Learning. This is a video slideshow, and I'm going to narrate you through the photographs that I've taken in classrooms where I've provided professional development to teachers to guide them in ways of creating their environments and their classrooms to support learners in the learning cultures model. So to begin with, the ethos that drives learning cultures is, is liberty, is freedom of students and the importance of students having space to be able to express themselves and, and move around and affiliate and interact with others and to learn the, to use these freedoms responsibly. So space is of primary importance. So the first slides are of students using space and how to create spaces for students to have freedom. For many kids, this kind of freedom will be something that's new in school. Most kids come to learning culture schools having been in schools where teachers really held all the authority and where their freedom was really restricted by teachers' directives. So the beginning of the year usually involves, for students who are new to the school, instruction in how to use and exercise freedom. So there are procedures for teaching norms and procedures and rules and responsibilities. For example, in learning cultures, time is structured around what we call the activity block. Every activity block begins with typically a lesson, which normally isn't more than 10 minutes in length. Uh, it's normally teacher directed. It's normally an account of a narrative of something uh, that, that students did that's worthy of showing off, um, that demonstrates some kind of competence that is uh, beneficial for others to learn and understand. The bulk of the activity block consists of work time. Uh, and then the block ends with share. It's writing share during writing block, writing activity block and its uh, content share in all other subjects. Within activity time or within work time, uh, there occur a number of different formats depending on what activity block it is. In a reading block, there might be cooperative unison reading or mindful reading. There might be reading conferences. In algebra, there might be uh, integrative math, cooperative unison reading, work time. In writing, there may be writing table shares, independent writing, writing conferences. So there's a diagram that we show students that helps them visualize what space and time and what these formats look like. We also teach the students the rubrics. Rubrics are used to teach teachers the expectations for how uh, the learning cultures formats are to be implemented and they're also used as a tool to teach students. So in the beginning of the year teachers make format binders so that all the formats rubrics are, are collected in one space and they can be used to help norm and secure positive norms in the classroom. And these rubrics are also laminated and dispersed across the room and located where the formats take place. In addition to the rubrics and the activity systems or the activity block and the, the format structures, we also teach the social contract. And that's essentially the school or the district discipline code and the behavior expectations. It comes with kind of a, an overview of the historical context of education and human rights. And the, the social contract is a really important document that's referred to frequently throughout the year, and there's a whole system called Keepers of the Culture that's part of another course. Once these have been taught, the environment should have remnants of this instruction, and these uh, artifacts should be used and referred to frequently by teachers and peers in order to secure these norms in the culture of the classroom. So the next set of slides are pictures of examples in classrooms where these remnants exist.
Learning cultures is a curriculum of student responsibility and an extension of the social contract is students taking responsibility. So schedules become really important in the learning cultures model. And the room, the environment is really filled with uh, cues to students and how they need to take responsibility, reminders to help them self-regulate so that they adhere to expectations for systems and schedules. So the next set of slides show you uh, pictures of how teachers have set up these systems. The, the formats may on the face look complex. There are a number of them and for teachers kind of accustomed to running the schedule as sort of a one-person show, it may appear like there are a lot of uh, plates spinning at once. But in reality, once the, the formats are taught to students and once they're held accountable for, for following through on their responsibilities, kids are really, really good at taking responsibility. So it's a matter of teaching to responsibilities and then providing them the tools to be able to take responsibility to learn to internalize their responsibilities. The environment plays a really important role in helping teach responsibility. The curriculum in learning cultures isn't scripted or determined by the teacher. Kids come up with their own topics, and in order to do that, they need to have a purpose for what they read and write about. It's impossible to have a purpose if you don't care about things. It's hard to write if you don't have an audience. And so in learning cultures, environments, and in learning cultures, communities, we need to make sure as teachers that we make sure that students have audiences. That comes in the form of making sure that, that there are places for students to have share in the formats. We have the writing share and we have table shares and we have conferences where kids get to share their writing. And we also have uh, writing walls where kids get to display their writing. So in these images you're going to see the writing walls. Kids are responsible for maintaining their own exhibition space and they change up the writing as new pieces come along. We also have genre display walls. In order for kids to be able to have a command of generic forms, they need to be exposed to a wide range of possible forms so that they can learn to appropriate and incorporate devices effectively in order to execute their purpose. And so teachers in their classrooms have genre walls. And you'll see in these slides, there are pictures of genre walls in teachers' classrooms. At the beginning of the year, you can do genre exposure lessons during your writing lesson. And as time goes on, students will begin to introduce the most creative and novel forms that they'll then want to put on the genre display walls. In addition to genre display walls, texts that students have encountered through the curriculum in unison reading and independent reading also become inspiration for their writing. In classrooms, teachers keep what we call retired unison reading texts. Here's a picture of some retired texts that have been categorized by topic. And teachers also keep hanging file folders of text exemplars. And every classroom needs to have materials and resources available to students so that they can, when they're making choices, have materials that they need and artifacts in order to execute and act on their purposes and activities. So here are some slides, images of classrooms where teachers have made good use of materials, have provided lots of engaging materials for students. Students are expected to follow the rules of unison reading. Rule number two is to stop the group if you have something to say or if you have a question. And so oftentimes students stop the group because they don't know a word. They don't know how to pronounce it or they don't know its meaning. Over time, kids accumulate a treasure trove of vocabulary. This is a picture of Savina McNamara's sixth grade classroom. This wall is called Words of Wisdom. So in many classrooms, teachers save space on the walls for students to post words that were generated through breaches in unison reading. This is a word wall, and at the beginning of the year, 
teachers post the most frequently used words on the word wall in primary classroom. And then as time goes on, what we do is um, we call it word sprinkles. As kids need words, we give them words on index cards, and then those words get posted on the word wall. And then as time goes on, we add more and more words to the word wall. We incorporate a usage-based theory of language acquisition into learning cultures, which means that we believe that people learn language through using language. And so we believe that we should give children access to words as they need to use them. And that's how they learn words. That's how they learn language. So words are not dispensed according to a linear transmission model. A child doesn't have to learn one set of words or sounds or set of letters before they learn another in a series. They learn whatever words, letters, or sounds they need as they're using them, as they're needed in use. They're given when needed and learn through use. Kids are also given what we call word cards. So in all classrooms through high school, there are word cards on all tables during reading and writing time so that kids can, again, through the use of words in their writing, refer to the word cards so that they have opportunities when they're writing to write the most frequently used words automatically, fluently, and accurately. Finally, teachers need tools themselves. The learning culture's curriculum isn't one of following a scripted curriculum, giving students worksheets and exercises, but of setting students free to engage in the formats and doing a lot of close observation and record keeping. So record keeping systems are important in the learning cultures model. And these are some examples of photographs of how teachers have kept and maintained their record systems. In learning cultures, classroom space is really given over to students. The teacher's role is to work beside students to facilitate their uh, self-regulation to the expectations of the formats. And so the traditional notion of the teacher at the front of the classroom orchestrating activity it has really disappeared in learning cultures. You no longer need a large teacher's desk occupying you know, 20 cubic feet of classroom space, the teacher's desk can be tucked into a closet. And this is a picture of the desk of uh, teacher Jacob Rees, Meredith Jacks. She was the writing teacher at Jacob Rees. And you can see her desk is tucked into her closet. I thought that nicely symbolized the position of the teacher's desk in a learning cultures classroom.